We need to have choice, but the word choice is being misused uh, right now in our country. The, the choice that most people want is a choice of doctor, a choice of hospital, free choice. Right now, people say we have choice, the governments say we have choice. We don't. If you're in an HMO, you're limited to the bank of doctors that they have signed up, and you can't go outside of that, or you pay out of pocket. So if you were in an HMO that's here in New York State, and you go to visit your children in, in uh, California, and you get sick, then you go to a California doctor, you pay for that out of pocket, unless it's a, a national company, that, or you have what they call a service. So what they're saying by choice is you have choice of who whether you want private insurance or public insurance, how you want it paid for. I don't think most consumers care about how it's paid for, just so you have uh, get treated. The thing we want choice in is in treatment, not in who pays the bill, as long as the bill gets paid. Does it matter who pays it, just so it gets paid. But the, if you listen to Hillary or you listen to Obama, well, he doesn't know much about it, actually. And if you listen to Edwards, if you listen to the people who are talking, they're all talking about, you have to have choice, but the choice they're talking about is choice of the payer, the insurance company, not the choice of treatment. And that's, the, they've misused it, so now people don't understand what choice means. white or gray down here at the bottom. 
it's what charities spend to help people that need help. So it's all the private spending by private organizations, that the social service organizations like uh, like the Long Island Council of Churches, which helps people with, with various things when they need it, and Catholic charities and uh, Jewish appeal have a group, Maison, uh, all of them. So that that five percent represents the charities of the non-profit uh, private organizations. So you can see that it divides pretty much in half, which gives us a very impossible, mixed up, non-system for health care. So we have, on the public side, we have Medicare, and then we have Medicaid, which is an eligibility thing for people below the poverty line. Right now, the poverty line is impossible. I have to tell you that to live on Long Island and pay all your bills and your taxes and have health insurance, you need at least $60,000 for a family of four. And there are lots and lots of people that aren't making $60,000. $40,000 uh, might get by if you don't buy health insurance and uh, don't do a couple of other things. But we have a uh, thing worked out. And yet the federal poverty level is now at $20,000 for a family of four. Nobody living on Long Island can make family of four, they all end up in the food pantries by about the 21st of the month if they can get food stamps. Then there's Child Health Plus in New York State, there's Family Health Plus. Do you all know about those? No. Yes, no. You say no, I'll tell you what they are. Okay. I'd like to know more about them. Okay. Uh, New York State passed a bill some years ago when they realized that the poverty line, Medicaid, for let's say a mother with babies, the level is so low that a person going to school might be $5 above the income level and not be able to get Medicaid and be pregnant a college student, let's say, uh, uh, or some college student age and can't get uh, help and doesn't have an income. So they set up something called Child Health Plus. This is a New York State thing. And it was to take people above Medicaid, but what they call the working poor, that would be everybody from Medicaid eligible, no welfare people, they're already in Medicaid, up to 200% poverty. So if the level is 20000 for a family of four, then they would take up to $40,000. And those children can all be enrolled in New York State and have free health care. And the state pays for it, what they call Child Health Plus, CHP. The government, then the national government later took it over and set up SCHIP, which is state child health insurance program, which is doing the same thing at a different level. It isn't as good as New York State's. That means that what the national government is paying for is less. So if they go and pay up to here, and New York State's paying here, we use the national government's money up to here, and then we add a little bit on top, bring it up to the level that, that we're paying. Then they found that the parents of these children that were being Health with child health insurance uh, would get sick with the flu, pass it to the kids, and the kids would pass it back to the adults, and nothing could help the adults. So the state here in New York State set up something called Family Health Plus, which means that the, the parents of children in Children Health Plus can also get help and their insurance. And that program has been vilified by our present national administration. So we have Medicare for the over 65s, so we have Child Health Plus for the under 18, and it's the in-between group that is left out, and we have some family help for people in the in-between group if they happen to be parents of children on Child Health Plus. Then Native Americans, under a treaty from way back, have their insurance paid if they're on the reservation. If they move to the city, they go off of it. They don't get it anymore. But Indians who live on reservations have health care such as it is. It isn't always terrific. And there's the Veterans Administration, which is paid for by the government. And then there's the military, all the military take care of their own. And all of those things are public, paid for by out of our taxes or out of Social Security or whatever the arrangement happens to be. On the private side, we have private insurance either given by the employer or by the unions or 
by individuals or by their own policies, and they can be with a for-profit group or a not-for-profit group, although there's almost no not-for-profits left. Anyways, because of that, we've got all this myriad of stuff, and then we've got 47 million people without insurance. And that falls into the working poor, mainly, the people who are above Medicaid level, but too low in salary to be able to afford to buy insurance. Or they're working for a small business that can't afford to give its employees insurance. Or they're working uh, for themselves, self-employed, like artists and writers and people like that, and they can't afford the insurance. If you buy individually, it costs you practically twelve to $15,000 a year. You're putting out $1,000 a month. And most people on low salaries can't pull out a thousand a month for insurance. If you're in a group policy, you don't have to put out that much. But so people have been thinking that this system has been bad, it's been getting worse, and it's going to get worse because employers are beginning to dump their retirees because it, they can't carry it anymore. Uh, look at GM, fourteen hundred dollars in every car goes for health insurance for their present employees and their retirees. So people began thinking, how can we uh, fix this system? And I'm first going to mention some of the principles that are important in a, in a health care system, if you want a universal health care system. One, people say health care is a human right. Uh, probably you've all heard that. And around the world, people feel it's a right, just as much as public education is a right. So health care should be too. And that, that means that the markets cannot really handle what's a human right. Markets are for things you can choose to have or not have, like buying a television. You can't choose to be sick or not to be sick. You don't have that choice. The second is it has to be universal. It has to apply to everybody. Universal should be apply to everybody equally. Everybody, regardless of age, gender, uh, nationality, etc. It should be comprehensive. That is, any good system should include primary and preventive care. None of the stuff we have now includes primary and preventive care. You don't get a yearly physical without paying for it out of pocket. It isn't included in insurance. You don't get vision, you don't get dental care, you don't get um, preventive screenings. Mammograms they've managed to get on, get them on and have them paid for, but a lot of other tests that should be done regularly as part of prevention and preventive lifestyles, talking to you about lifestyle, all of that. There's no time, there's no way a doctor's being paid now for giving you advice or talking to you and helping you see what's going on. He's only paid for procedures. And when he sends in his bill to whatever company he's sending it to, he lists every procedure and he gets so much for every procedure, which means he's more interested in doing more procedures and he'll repeat procedures on you in order to get more money in for his income but they allow no time or no money for talking to the patient. Only for an MRI, a CAT scan, uh, an x-ray, uh, a blood test, whatever you're going to do. So we're being over-tested because doctors are low on income, the pay is not enough, and they then order more procedures than needed to. If you go to your primary care physician and he orders, let's say, an x-ray or something, you're getting arthritis and he orders an x-ray of your knee. And then you are sent to the orthopedist, he'll repeat the x-ray. He won't use the one that was there before. You don't need that double set of uh, radiation. There's no reason why the first x-ray couldn't be taken. And you, especially now it's on computers, we can just call it up on his computer from where it was taken. And so comprehensive insurance would be one that actually has rehab and home care and long-term care and hospice and vision and dental care and preventive care and screening besides catastrophic care. We need to have choice, but the word choice is being misused uh, and right now in our country. The, the choice that most people want is a choice of doctor, a choice of hospital, free choice. Right now, people say we have choice, the governments say we have choice. We don't. If you're in an HMO, you're limited to the bank of doctors that they have signed up, and you can't go outside of that, or you pay out of pocket. So, what they're saying by choice is you have choice of who, whether you want private insurance or public insurance, how you want it paid for. I don't think most consumers care about how it's paid for, just so you have, you get treated. 
the thing we want choice in is in treatment, not in who pays the bill. As long as the bill gets paid, does it matter who pays it? Just so it gets paid. But the, if you listen to Hillary or you listen to Obama, well, he doesn't know much about it, actually. And if you listen to Edwards, if you listen to people who are talking, they're all talking about you have to have choice. But the choice they're talking about is choice of the payer, the insurance company, not the choice of treatment. And that's the, they've misused it, so now people don't understand what choice means. Then we need access. Just the fact your insurance is paid doesn't mean you have access to care. So you've got to be sure that if a person has insurance, they have access to, there are lots of doctors that are, can't take any more patients. There are lots of hospitals that don't have enough room for anybody more because they've been cut back and cut back so much. So we need to have access. And then we need to have some way to cut the costs, keep the costs down. We're skyrocketing with the costs in healthcare. It's going up twice as fast as the cost of living index and it, we just have got to get rid of it. Everybody says, well, let's first get rid of the fraud. That would account for maybe 1% of the costs. It's not going to be worth it. But our politicians are saying, if we could get rid of the fraud, we would be okay. Fraud isn't enough. You'll always have some degree of fraud in any scheme. Doesn't matter whether we get single payer or whether we get something else. There'll be some degree of fraud, but it will be more than 1%, 2%. So you don't um, worry about, about it. You're not going to get, ever get it down to zero. And you just got to accept that. But it isn't enough to bring down costs generally around the world. In the, in the private insurance companies, only 65% of the money they take in goes to pay the care of patients. They have to pay their stockholders. They have to pay for all the advertising they do, Salabrex, Neox, etc. Uh, what is it now, Lunesta, I see every day. They're going over the heads of the doctor straight to the public. Do you know how much a television ad costs? A whole minute ad and you run it three or four times in every program. The cost of meds is what's putting, pushing it up. And the cost of uh, HMOs, uh, any private company, they've got to pay their, you know that the cheapest CEO in a private com company is earning $10 million a year plus stock options. No, who needs $10 million a year? What can you do with $10 million a year? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that we have in this country too many specialists and not enough primary care physicians. Most other countries have a huge base of primary care physicians and then they have a few specialists. And especially we're overrun with specialists in suburban areas, which is where we live. We have far too many orthopedists, far too many cardiologists, far too many people that only do one little narrow slice of health care. And we don't. Now, if we had a single payer system, we would have one form. There might be two forms, but I mean, it would, and it would be national, it would be computerized, it would go on a computer to a central database. three people doing instead of 300. That's right. So what are the attempts have been? We've had all kinds of attempts to get universal health care. The present bill that's up is called H.R. 676. It's put up by Conyers, John Conyers of uh, Michigan. Uh, he's the man who's doing it. I put a thing out there. You can have it. We've prepared this with sicko with being shown. And so it's got a lot of references to sicko on it. But um, it gives you the, in general, what it covers, but I, I have to tell you that it's called House Resolution 676, that's mm -hmm. what the HR stands for. Mm -hmm. It's a resolution until they have 120 co-sponsors. When they get 120 co-sponsors, then it can go to committee and become a hearing in a committee and go to the Rules Committee and come to the floor as a bill to be de debated. But right now it's still only a resolution. We've been watching it creep up from 60 co-sponsors to 70, I think it's at 86 right now. But we still got to get up to 120. There's not a single person on Long Island of our legislatures who signed on to the Conyers bill. And that means the four Democrats plus Peter King, and you know, you know that Peter King is going to do it. But Tim Bishop hasn't signed on, Gary Ackerman hasn't signed on, Carol McCarthy hasn't signed on, and Steve Israel. They're the four Democrats. None of them have signed on. Do you have a lot of insurance agents that come to Florida? Mm -hmm. Every place has a lot of insurance agents. Yeah. Peter King is a Republican and he's adamant and he's the uh, most difficult to deal with of the, yes. of the five. Yeah. And you're in this area, is Peter King's area. So uh, 
we aren't even attempting to, but we are trying to lobby the other four and to get them to sign on. We need a hundred, over a hundred, probably a hundred and twenty, to get this bill to go from a resolution to a hearing in a committee, the health committee, and then the rules committee, and then become a bill. And until it becomes a bill, there's no hope of it being passed. So what all of us can do, you'll see on the back, this is prepared for SICKO, uh, is to write letters and push your congressmen to sign on to this bill. It would be great. It doesn't affect our two senators, because this is a House bill. So Schumer and Clinton are not the people who need to go after us. The five, six, I think they're five on Long Island. Uh, that we need to push, and not one of them is. And I saw another bill just come up the other day, and I looked, not one of ours has signed on to it. Something that has a lot of sponsors it makes me ill. So I want to go and say that, talk both the national and the state right now, what's happening. Everybody feels that this is our best opportunity to get someplace. So everybody has been revving up. All the nonprofits have been revving up and saying, in order to have enough clout, we've got to be bigger. We've got to have masses of people. So different coalitions have been joining together to form a big one. And a huge one is formed for single payer. And in New York City area and around New York State, it's called the Private Health Insurance Must Go Coalition. And it's um, got in it the Physicians for uh, National Health Plan, PNHP. It's got Healthcare Now, which a woman named Marilyn Clement has gotten started. It's a national organization. It's running bus tours through the area, talking to people. They make 10-day bus tours. She's doing all kinds of things. It has ACT UP, which is an AIDS organization. It's got uh, the Brecht Forum in New York City. It's got about 30 organizations. The, the uh, Student Medical AMSA, American Medical Students Association, is in it. The physicians and surgeons, the uh, American surgeons are pushing for it. The American pediatricians are pushing for it. You know, there are a lot of specialty uh, professional organizations that not. And the Nurses Association nationally and New York State are for single payer. They're, they're into this mix. New York State Nurses Association is in it. Um, various other groups are in it. The big and we're doing a lot of lobbying of legislators, a lot of letters, and we're, what we're trying to do is get letters to newspapers and editors and get them in as often as you can. We've been fairly successful at Newsday, not so successful at the New York Times. We have uh, one or two people have been trying the Wall Street Journal, but that's an even more difficult thing to do. But some people have felt this is doable. So since you don't have somebody to present the other side, I'm going to tell you that what's going on on the other side, there, the Citizen Action Group, which includes Long Island Progressive Coalition here on Long Island, Richard Kirsch in Albany, has felt that we can't get all the way. We'll never get it through. The politicians will never vote for a single payer, even though the push from the public is big, over 70%. So they say, let's get something that's doable and do something. So what they're offering is sort of what Hillary Clinton is offering right now and what the Obama and Edwards, what all the Democratic uh, people are offering, which is what they call a public-private plan. Let's let everybody keep the insurance they have now. If they're happy with it, let them stay. But let's set up a Medicare-like public insurance that would cover from 18 to uh, 65, the area that's not covered by any public policy right now. And people can choose, do they want the public one or do they want the private one? In order to make that work, you have to do some things that the uh, private companies are not going to want to do any more than they want single payer. In order to do it, you must first remove pre-existing conditions. They can't say, I will take this person because they have pre-existing conditions. They also cannot have different premium charges. Whatever everybody's doing for benefits, everybody must do. They can't say, this one will have this set of benefits, and this one will have a different set of benefits. And they also must change their medical loss ratio, which is now called the care share ratio. That means if you're spending 100% of the premium into a company like Medicare, 
97% that goes into patient care, only 3% goes into administration. Medicare is unusually efficient, believe it or not. The companies are only spending about 65 to 70% of the money they take in on patient care. The rest is going for marketing, CEO salaries, stockholders. If we insist that they have to have at least 85% into direct care, that will cut their profits. The hope would be that people, they would gradually sort of drop out of business because they can't make money. Do you realize that every HMO right now is being subsidized by the government at 112% of what they would give for a public one of 100% so that they can make money? That we're, our taxes are helping them make money? The, the Medicare HMOs that have come into existence for, thanks to the guy in the White House, uh, in order to privatize, he's trying to destroy Medicare before he gets out of office. And one of the things he's doing is privatize it. So he offers Medicare choice. You can belong to an HMO that will offer you more benefits, no co-payments, and all the stuff that Medicare, traditional Medicare fee-for-service does not offer. Well, they can't make enough money that way. So the government is subsidizing them at a higher rate than for standard Medicare. So that public money is helping the private companies make a profit. And if you take away their profit, that, that subsidy, they probably can't make a profit, at least with the amount of marketing and the amount of uh, uh, CEO salaries that they're putting out. These organizations, Citizen Action of New York, and the, of which LIPC is one branch, and uh, a whole lot of Families USA, and uh, some others of the big organizations that have been working on health care, have decided that we should do this public-private, because if you ask people to give up their insurance, they have very good insurance. They're going to say, no, I don't want to give up what I have. So don't make them give it up. Say, you can keep what you have if you're happy with it. If you're not, we're offering a public plan. Now, some people say that's the first step to universal health care, because the public plan will have the same things offered as the private plans, and therefore it will be cheaper because it doesn't have the marketing costs. And people would shift gradually to the public plan as being preferable, and that would leave the private plans gradually going out of business. Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? <laughs> if you do single payer income taxes, that immediately means you pay no premiums, you have no co pays anymore, you have no auto insurance, medical expenses, workman's compensation drops out, unemployment benefits, the medical part drop, all those things you don't have to pay anymore. But you have to recognize that there are 435 representatives in Congress. There are 800 lobbyists for health care insurance. Two for each one congressman who are paying them out money, who are paying for their golf uh, membership, who are taking them out to dinner, who are giving them a free trip to Cancun for a vacation, paying their airport. It's the, the Lewin Group. Colorado want to have a, a, a new health plan, and so they have a study done, and they asked this research group, which is a nonpartisan uh, research group that's not biased either way, and they took four different possibilities, and they studied them, and the first one was called Better Health Care for Health. This is the summary. The actual thing is about 30, 40 pages long. You download it from uh, your uh, system. And they looked at the one, this one, which offers public-private and said there are now this many uninsured. When you finish with this, you'll cut it from 47 million to or whatever their number was down to this, and you'll spend $595 million more than you're spending now. Then they took Solutions for a Healthy Colorado, the second plan, which was a, a private sector plan, plus Medicaid and Child Health Plus, and said you'll cut the number of uninsured down to 133,000, and it'll cost you 271 million more. Then they took a plan for covering Colorado. When they got through, the only one that saved them money and got everybody covered so there'd be no uninsured was the single payer one. Wow. 